Good evening, everybody. Today we are approaching the end of the road on, uh, on the ladders. It's the ladder of, for the last church, the church of uh, Laodicea. So let's get right down to business. And let's start by praying, inv invoking the Holy Spirit to be with us today. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much for your blessings towards us. Thank you so much for another day. Uh, and thank you for your love and care uh, for your church and for each one of us. Help us to understand your love more. Help us to see your love throughout history and throughout our own lives. Bless us now as we, we read that last piece of the letters to the churches. And help us to hear your voice to us. That's what we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Already. So, uh, one thing, it's very important before we start. Like, everybody, when they think about Laodicea, they think like, oh, it's such a bad church. And like, it's uh, like, uh, as I heard once before, like I was giving a Bible study about it. And then the person like uh, said something like, oh, like, why the church that represents us today is like so bad? It's like, uh, why, like, it seems like, like, to begin with, there is no praise. Like, the first church, there, there was no, that was only praise. That, that one has no praise at all. It's like just... Like a, uh, uh, like critiques and uh, so why is that? But remember that like uh, there's a few things that we have to keep in mind. First, that God is love. Second, that the Bible also says that God uh, uh, he disciplines those that he love. So like those uh, like uh, very sober words, they are meant to wake us up. But one thing also is important, the other thing is also important, like that analogy of the uh, pictures. It's the same church that was like once pure and everything. And the love that he had for the first church is the same that he has for the last one, because they are one and the same, just in different ages. And another reminder is the fact that like, uh, when uh, the church reached to that point, it's like everything else that she had. Like the same church that uh, is now lukewarm is the same church that has like a, still an open door for mission, an open door to do its job, and today more than ever, because uh, never before people were like so looking for a solution. The problem is that we are not giving that solution. The solution is here, but we try to preach another gospel. So uh, let's uh, now focus on our reading. Let's start by reading Revelation three, chapter 3, verses 14 to 22. Is it on? It's green now. Okay. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I would wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. And because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich in white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. 
As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to, be, grant to set with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So, like here we are in the last church, and even in the way Jesus introduces himself, it already gives that sense of finality, like he says that he's the amen. Uh, amen is a word in Hebrew that means like a for sure, with certainty. But we usually use it on the final, on the end of a phrase, like to, see, to say that that's going to happen. So uh, we have that already there. But before we go too deep on this, uh, just a little background, because it's important for us to understand who was this city and who was this church so we can see how it relates to us. The city of Laodicea is on Turkey, in, in Turkey. It's uh, about 40-something miles from Philadelphia. And uh, because it was like the, uh, the end of the road, it was also a very uh, commercial city because it was uh, a great way for a new province. And uh, most of the city wealth came from three sources. First, they had like a cloth manufacturing. There was like a huge textile industry there. And like they exported throughout the world, like all sorts of garments. And, uh, and uh, those are like very famous, like people from all over. It's like Paris was like 50 years ago. Uh, today, people still say, Paris is still all that, but it's kind of not, not anymore. But that's the same thing with Laodicea. And because of their strategic place, and because of the trade that they had, they had people from all over the world, so they have a huge banking industry. They have gold, and they are so rich that once they were completely destroyed by, the, by an earthquake, and they they said to the Roman government when they offer, like, do you guys want money, want help? Like, no, no, we can, we can do ourselves. And they did it all by themselves, and they, they built the city even more beautiful than it was before. And uh, the city also had a third industry that was like uh, they manufactured uh, like uh, uh, ointments, especially I ice owls, like uh, so they had like a special pounder that was like, was, uh, had medicinal properties, and they would mix with the, the water that was like volcanic and a few other things, and they would make like some eye drops that cured a lot of the, the diseases of the time. So they had that uh, too. And out of that was the source of their pride. They, they were like rich was like uh, probably like, uh, like if you guys ever go to a places like uh, Dubai or Qatar where the World Cup is, like they are very rich places. Like you don't see a peasant on the streets. You, like uh, you take a cab, the cab is a Lamborghini, is a Ferrari or like a, like a, uh-huh. And uh you go to the ATM, uh, you can like, actually get gold out of the ATM. <laughs> yeah. Because like, the money is just for the foreigners. Like, they, they like the real stuff. So like, uh, and those guys are very proud people. And they don't work either. Don't work either like, uh, by, their by the servants. And now like, uh, like the, the, for example, in Qatar. 15% of the population is Qatari. All the rest are the foreigners that work for them. And every single one 
gets their equivalent of social security, but with a lot more zeros on it. Wow. <laughs> wow. So it's, it's, it's a different world. And they are very proud. Like uh, I once was uh, traveling to the region and I uh, had a dinner with uh, one of the princes of Qatar. Mm -hmm. And like the guy was uh, like so proud of himself. But then I thought, okay, the guy's a prince. So, okay. But now talking with the people on the streets, they spoke as if like uh, they were the only humans on the planet. Everybody else is like the second, uh, one level down. So like, and that was the type of proud that that uh, community had because of the riches, because of like, when I read this, like uh, before I visit this place, I, I could not really phantom it, but, but that is it. And uh, that, uh, that overall like uh, way of uh, being took over the church as well. So the church was proud. They thought they, they had like everything. And, uh, and that's sad. That's sad because that church represents us. And uh, in a way, we are also proud because we have Jesus, because we have the truth, because this, because that. And we forget that we may have everything, but if not come from Jesus, it doesn't work. So let's uh, start in how Jesus introduces himself. I mentioned that he introduces himself first saying, he uses three titles. He says he, he is the amen, the one that's truthful, the one that's real. Uh, and uh, so he is reality in, in itself. And then the next thing that he says that he's the true witness, somebody that you can really rely on. He's not only the truth in person, but he is truthful in everything he does. And if that was not enough, it's, he's identified as the beginning of creation. What that is, what that means, he's the one that originated everything. And I feel especially inter, uh, interesting the choice of the title, because that's the church that represents us. Uh, that the church that starts in 1844, like when the time of the end started. Uh, but you know what else was published for the first time in 1844? No. The, um, uh, that Darwin book. Darwin, yeah, evolution. Yeah, the... Yeah, but that's not the title of the book, no, but that's what the, it's, it's about. about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the first draft was published this year. And like, that was the age of like secularism, of people like trying to explain God out of the picture. Creation is like just a fairy tale. Uh -huh. And now he's saying here, on that day and age that people discredit creation, I am the beginning of the creation. I made creation happen. So, uh, and in a way, that's a, uh, a face-off of the reality today. Because the, the God we represent is the one that created everything. But we live in a time and place where people have a hard time to believe that that actually happened. So... Uh, that's like just setting the stage. So, and when I read this, that actually gives me trust because he knew that uh, creation would be doubted. And he wants us to reaffirm. And fast forwarding, if you fo go to Revelation 14, that's also the core of the three angels' message. The very first message talks about the God that created uh, everything. So, as I mentioned, that church, they, they have not, nothing good to say about it. 
So let's go and uh, take a look on the appraisal uh, of that church. What's the thing that uh, jumps you the most on that uh, nice description that, he, that the Bible makes of us? Like, uh, that he loves us enough even with our flaws to keep working on us. Mm-hmm. And he introduces himself as the witness, the faithful witness that we will be with us with to the end. And uh, how he started, he says, like, I know what you're doing. I know that you're not neither cold or hot. I wish you, you were either, either one of them. Like, uh, that's not a pretty, pretty thing. And even that's like a, uh, actually something that was related with uh, the city in itself. The city had no natural source of water. Uh, so their water was like volcanic water that didn't taste very good. So they had to bring water like from miles and miles. By the time the water reached the city, it was like uh, warm, like was like mm -hmm, it was not nice to to drink. And uh, so, and he's playing with that because that reflects their condition. Like uh, it's, I pastor and visit and a whole bunch of churches throughout the the planet, and like. Some of the worst churches I visited, or I, or I pastor, are churches that they think they are like the last Oreo from the package. Like they think like they are it. <laughs> like, uh, oh, we have those beautiful traditions. We do this, we do that, but they are dying, not even knowing. But in a sense, we can fall on that trap even as a person. Because that's why, like, uh, he, uh, he says, like, I wish you were one or the other. Why? Because if you're really hot spiritually, there's no problem. And if you're really down there, you know it. You know you need something. You may not want to do anything about it, but you know it. But when you are under like that... Uh, on that twi twilight zone, comfort, comfort zone, like, uh, oh, I'm doing, okay. I may do, uh, but I'm not that bad. I do this, this, this. I may do this, but uh, so we play those games and we, we try to stay like within the, param the parameters of the good enough. I'm good enough. I try to, and uh, that's a tragedy. That's a tragedy. Uh, and uh, that caused uh, God to feel a lot of pain because he cannot help those that don't want to be helped, those, those that don't, don't even realize they need help. That's why the words are hard, to make sure we realize we need his help. We need his help. And uh, they are not condemned as the churches before them by apostasy or by heresy or they are condemned by like having one foot in, in God's kingdom, the other foot on the kingdom of the enemy. Like to have divided uh, allegiances. And uh, it's interesting the comparison that he makes. Like uh, he says here, he plays with the city. He plays with the pride of the city. He says like, uh, uh, on the next verse, I, uh, you say, I'm very rich. I have become wealthy. I need nothing. And you don't know that you are wretch, miserable, blind, and naked. The church was rich. The city was rich. They had a lot of gold. But they were spiritually poor. They had like a stuff that would cure the eyes of everybody, but their own eyes were closed and they needed help from Jesus. And uh, 
They were spiritually naked, although they export clothing throughout. And then Jesus says on the next verse, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined on fire that you may be rich, a white garment that you may be cloth clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with the eye salve that I provided that you may see it. So like, what he's saying here, uh, Jesus, we may have like wonderful truth without Jesus mean nothing. We may have all the resources on the world. And today, although we are a small church, we are a rich church. We are a powerful church. Uh, but if we don't have Jesus, we don't have anything. Because what we can manufacture, what we can produce, means nothing. That's why he recommends, buy gold from me. Let me provide the resources. Let me open your eyes with my Holy Spirit. Let me clothe you with the righteousness of my uh, sacrifice, with my own righteousness. So God is calling us to a revival and to, and to forsake whatever worldly we may think we have, whatever edge we may think we have, to allow him to be God in our lives. And if we don't uh, I'll realize that we are in such a poor condition, he cannot help us unless we allow him to be God in our lives. And that's a very tragic position to be. Uh, it's, it's interesting, also the name of the church. Laodicea. Me, Lao means... Uh, uh, law or like mean righteousness or mean like judgment, like being just. And uh, mean sorry, law means people. And daikos means uh, justice or being righteous or something. So the word can be translated in two ways, and both ways are kind of descriptive of the condition of the church and our condition. It can be translated as a righteous people or people from justice, and they thought themselves like that, as we think we are of that. But uh, can also mean people of the judgment, of people that will be judged. Like, so kind of describes both sides of the coin of who we are. We may have our own perceptions of life, of how good Christians we are, how humble we are. We even uh, proud ourselves of our, of our humility. So, and, uh, but the other side is like, God knows who we really are. Although we may not know, he knows. That's why it's important for us to seek him and uh, to be with him so he can give to us what we think we already have. So he can give to us what we really uh, need. So that counsel is for us today. You may be thinking, oh, I don't need that. I'm fine with God. The truth is, nobody's fine with God. We always need, each one of us need his mercies. And uh, one thing that I've discovered through life is like, the closer I get to Jesus, the more I see my, my own shortcomings. So, chances are, if you're on the height of your high heels and thinking, I'm rich, I don't need anything, that you are needing more Jesus on your life. Only Jesus can give you the vision. Only Jesus can uh, sustain you for a fact, more than gold, more than anything. And only Jesus can cover our own nakedness, our own shortcomings. The hope 
for this world. It's not on politics. It's not in social justice. Although all those things are, have their, their place. It's not in like money, properties. You may have all that, but you still may be empty inside. And uh, you, the opposite is also true. You may have none of that. You may be living under a bridge. But if you have Jesus, you have everything that you need. Uh, that's why he says here in, in Revelation 3.19, like sometimes when we, we think, like, why he's being so mean? Uh, read again, Jerry, for me. Revelation 3.19. As, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. Yeah. So he, no, it, you had, you had, it, it, it was on. So like, uh, he loves us. That's why he's hitting hard. Because he, he doesn't want any one of us to, because of our pride, because of our, whatever it is, to get lost and like, in that I'm good enough. Or I'm trying to be good. Or I'm like, he doesn't want us to get caught by that. Uh, I want to read something that I think is very pertinent to that. Jerry, can you read for us Hebrews 12, 5 to 11, before I make the final application here? And you have... And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are, Ill are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and, light and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them. But he for our prophet, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful, but the present, for, or excuse me, for the present, but painful nevertheless. Afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So in other words, Jesus is saying, don't worry the problems you have today. Don't worry the sufferings that sometimes happen. He allows those things to happen so we can remind ourselves that we need him. This day more than ever, like uh, Jesus is at the door and he's begging for us to, to open. The next verse says exactly that. Behold, I'm the, at the door and I knock. Uh, that's a reference to a verse in uh, Song of Songs when uh, Solomon, when the, the groom is at the, the door and uh, knocking. That verse in Solomon is actually more telling because he's actually pounding, like uh, almost banging uh, the door down. Kind of tells the sense of urgency. And why that's so urgent? Because if you don't open the door of our hearts, Jesus cannot get in. And if he doesn't get in, he does not change us. Uh, I said that before. Like uh, I, I saw many times in uh, those uh, bumper sticker phrases like, Jesus is my co-pilot. No, that's wrong. You want him to be your pilot. Not your co-pilot. You, you don't want him on the side. You want him inside, behind the wheel, on the driver's seat. 
That's why he's pounding so hard, because he wants you to open that door. It's funny that the next chapter starts with an open door, a door that goes to heaven. Like a, but we, we can only go through that door if we open that door first. So he makes that like a very fervent uh, appeal. Let me enter. I have what you need. You think you know what you need. And we keep chasing our tails by trying to reach our goals. And if we do that without Jesus, we are just spinning. And uh, what's the advice that he makes to our of us? Like the, I mean, what's the promise that he makes for us that we will overcome? Because I hope and pray that our of us here today, we're going to persevere. We're going to overcome. We're going to be faithful to the end. What's the promise that he makes? Mm -hmm. uh, before we go there, I, I, I got excited here. I, I missed the one very important part of verse 20. Once you open the door, what happens? And he will dine with you. He's going to get intimate. Like that's the... Eating together is very intimate. And he wants that intimacy with us. And that's what we need. We need that intimacy with God. Without it, we will never get through the door that leads to salvation. So that's why he promised to the overcomer that he will grant uh, to sit with me in my throne. We, if we have intimacy with him here, that intimacy, that bond that is formed here on this earth, you transfer to eternity. You're going to have a relationship that nobody else has with Christ. Nobody else on the universe can claim that I'm the brother of, the, of God or I'm the sister of God. And he has that special bond with us. And... Uh, because we, we became intimate, we became family here. And if that's a reality here, that reality will uh, continue through eternity. And uh, what else he says? Uh, not only sit with me on my throne, uh, but he will be uh, with him forever in the same way he will be in the throne of God forever. So what's the appeal that God is making for the churches and especially for us today? Like, what's the appeal? What's the call of the Spirit for us? Because that's for us in all possible senses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We should not put our trust in any temporal prosperity in any material things, any things that humans can manufacture. Uh, and even if we indeed are rich, we have to regard everything as a gift from God. It's not ours. It's something that he gave us for his glory. And uh, let's wake up and let's... Uh, Ask God for discernment, for his spirit, so we can really see our condition. We need that eye salve. So we can see who you are, who we, who we are, what we need. We need the righteousness of Christ in our life. And we need his provision. Uh, Jesus is waiting for each one of us to individually answer. He's waiting for you and me. He wants to live and reign with you forever. But all needs to start with us opening the doors of our hearts every day. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we can hear your footsteps. We know that the day is 
fastly approaching. We also know that every minute that we live is an extra gift we receive from you because we can drop dead on this second and be no more. But we also learn today that although we are privileged because we know so much about the Bible, about you, but knowing about you will not make us any good. We need to be intimate with you. We need to open our door, the door of our heart, so you can enter, so we can have intimacy with you. Help us, dear Lord, to be a man and woman according to your own heart. Help us to surrender. Help us to see our own spiritual condition. If necessary, dear Lord, Make something happen in our lives. If necessary, give us dreams, visions, whatever it takes to wake us up. So we can seek you. So you can seek by your Holy Spirit as somebody that grasps for air. Because we need it. We need you. And without you, we cannot do anything. Bless us with your Holy Spirit. Transform our lives and uh, help us to realize how bad we need you. Help us to realize how bad is our need of you because we don't know anything. Please, help us in our own belief and help us to open our own door. Move our hands with, for us because we cannot do it ourselves due to our own condition. So, save us. Give us your discernment. Give us your eyes out. And give us your spirit. That's what we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.